And awesomely. Travis Kalnick, one of my oldest friends in the industry, I met him in 1997 or 98, I cannot remember which. 98. 98. And at the time, I believe it was your first company, yeah. was Scour. It was my second. Was it your second? It was my first tech company. Ah. My first company was a SAT prep company. An I SAT with, prep? Yeah, I started. But that was your first entrepreneurial activity? That's right. What That's was right. The, How old were you when you started the SAT prep? 18. 18? Yeah. Why on earth did you feel compelled to start a company at the age of 18? Uh, I mean, I didn't feel like compelled to start a company. It was, I was tutoring SATs. The first person I tutored yeah. went up by 400 points. Oh, wow. And I was tutoring everybody in the neighborhood. And then one of the fathers said, let's start a company. Ah. So I created the course. I hired the teachers, trained them, mm. and did the like 1,500 and over course. The 1,500 and over course? Yeah. So that, that was, was the, on a, when it was on a sixteen hundred basis. Sure, sure, eight hundred, right. eight hundred. Yeah. Now this is before they had the written essay on it. That's right. Um, and so you created the editorial device of fifteen hundred or better. Explain why you created that device. Well, it was just the so the 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 guy I started the company with was a he was a he was basically the father of one of the kids I was tutoring. He was a, he was a Korean guy. Right. And he did all of his marketing through the Korean church. Mm -hmm. And so we had a school of like 300 kids all from the church. Like it was right. like, he did all the marketing, like got these kids in. Um, and man, they were aggressive about getting the best scores. Right. And so 1500 and over is like, that's the elite. Right. And so, I love it. Like that's what I'm all about too. So let's let's go. So breaking down the, the, the construction of the company, yeah. really two critical things you learn there, I'm guessing. One is branding is critical. So the 1500 or better just yeah. instantly makes this aspirational kind of brand. And you figured out distribution yeah. and marketing, which was you found somebody who could distribute the product. Well, so here, the, I did the 1500 and over course. That was the one I taught and I trained all the other teachers. Right. The school was called New Way Academy. New Way. New Way. It was right. like, it wasn't a great brand. It was just like, right. and it didn't need branding because all the kids in the church went, right. like, they it was would viral. leave church and go to the school. I mean, right. it was like. But you did uh, pick a market segment to service. Yes. That really wanted the product. And the, the, you gave them a goal. The product, fair enough. Yeah. But the product was basically, in that, in that way, the product was, was me. Yeah. Right? Is that the teacher in an SAT prep school is everything. Ah. It's the teacher, and then it's the content. But right. but teacher even more than the content. Right. And so, so what do you just you just did really well on standardized tests when you were yeah, a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Did you what did you get on the SATs? What was your best score? Fifteen eighty. Fifteen eighty. Yeah. Was that like an official test, or was that like when you were in a practice session? That's like official. Official. You yeah. have a certificate of fifteen eighty. Yeah. One yeah. question wrong. Uh, it would be like two questions wrong on verbal. Ah. I'd always ace the math. Right. That, and that is the secret to the SATs, or at least previously yeah. when we took it which was the math is a finite amount of information, whereas sure. the verbal is an almost infinite amount. Not infinite, but it's I mean, 10 times larger corpus. You know what? Look, your, mat, your head is either, it's either left brain or right brain. Right. If it's left brain, you just kill it. I could get a 30-minute math section done in eight minutes, no problem. Right. You put me on the verbal, and my, my shoulders would hurt, my neck would hurt. I'd take the entire 30 minutes, right. and I'd be stressing. Right, interesting. But like math, I would just be like filling in bubbles. Now the second business you started was yeah, Scour. That's right. What was Scour? Okay, so Scour was a peer-to-peer -peer multimedia search engine. It was basically the first peer-to-peer -peer app out there. Right. The first way to find music, video, movies, images online, period. It and was started in 97 and actually it was a group of us. Um, there were a group of guys, we were all sort of computer science undergraduate association over at Scour, or sorry, over at UCLA. The first, uh, the first URL was scour.cs.ucla.edu. We, we would basically crawl people's shared Windows directories yep. and index the, f the files. Right. You would search for Britney Spears or whatever. You'd get your results. You'd click on a link, and there'd be a helper app, a peer-to-peer -peer app, that would use the what's called the SMB protocol to pull the files from other peers, right. sorry, other shared Windows shared directories. Right. Uh, and so it was point to point, because it wasn't replicating the files across multiple at that time. You, uh, you would c get the copy of the file, but you didn't automatically share it. Right. And that was the difference between us and Napster. Right. Sean Fanning was one of our users. Right. And the problem was is that 
we got so popular that we would overwhelm the, the window share directory folders that were out there. Right. There was too little supply and too much demand. Right. And so the links would get bad because 25 simultaneous connections into a Windows 95 desktop right. would shut it down. It would crash. Ah. And so the links would go bad. We'd have to crawl more of the internet to right. try to find more of these directory folders. But the bottom line is that Napster, like Sean was like, we can make this better. When I get the file, right. I'm going to automatically share it. Right. And so then demand and supply go up together. Right. And that was the big innovation that right. Napster did on us. Right. And then you went back and added that to the product. Yeah, and then of you course. did file normalization, right? So if like it knew that this was the same file. Yeah, you would hash it, you would do things yeah. like this. And so this is in ninety eight? This is ninety so the company was started in ninety seven. Wow. Um, late ninety seven, December. It was the um, first peer-to-peer -peer like, software. Amazing. It was the first peer-to-peer -peer software. It predated Napster by how many months? Uh, probably 18. Wow. And when did you meet Sean Fanning? I didn't meet Sean until 99 right. when we were on a panel together. Wow. And at that time, people looked at the peer-to-peer -peer space as what? Uh, how was it viewed by the industry? Uh, it was, well, it was like underground. Right. So if you're talking about like 97, 98, it was underground. Right. Nobody knew what it was. was. Right. College kids did. The only way to have broadband back then was to be on a college campus. Right. This was a product for college kids. Pre-DSL. Uh, DSL may Maybe have existed, but it was early, 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 early. Really early. And you probably only had 384 or something lame like that. Yeah, I mean, I don't remember, but it was a long time ago. And you raised money for the company. Yeah, we got money from a couple of interesting. I was based. We were based in L.A. Obviously, right. we raised money from a guy named Michael Lovitz. Right, sure. Former head of. He founded CAA, yep. president of Disney. Right. right? Uh, a and more then, legitimate player in the entertainment space could not be found than that. It depends what you. It Certainly depends. Right. People have different opinions on that. Right. Well, Ovitz is a polarizing character. That's but correct. Regardless, was the most powerful man in Hollywood for a decade. For sure. Yeah. Uh, and then another guy named Ron Burkle. Yeah. Who is the billionaire <laughs> yeah. who owns, uh, or owned the supermarket chain. Yeah. Yeah. He or still does. He was like Nathan. LBO style with Michael Milken, like right. he, billions him. of billionaire. Bought yeah. Ralph's. Right. He, did, I think he's still on the board of Yahoo, but maybe not anymore. How did you meet those two individuals at the age of 22 or 23 years old, I'm guessing? So how did I meet them? So we, we were at UCLA, right. and we got connected to a guy named Richard Wolpert, yeah. who you may remember. Yep. And he was like, at the time, sort of, I think he was a partner. He was like working with Ron Burkle on his VC. Right. Like his fund, essentially, right. which is ninety nine percent. Like Ron Burkle is ninety nine percent limited in his own fund. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. Because if you're a billionaire, you just invest your own money. Sure. And so, yeah. So so Wolpert was working with Owitz and Burkle, and he sort of brought us into the fold. Huh. We met a guy named Peter Levin. Yeah. I know. At Peter. some point. Yeah. And we signed an LOI with them. Right. Uh, it was four million dollars at the time. It was for. 51% of the company. Wow. Terms were slightly different back then. <laughs> well, we were college kids, too. Like, what do you know? It was, it was an interesting mix, right? Because it was, it was 99. Right. Sorry, it was 98, 99, right? Yeah. So there was craziness. But it was LA, not Silicon Valley. Right. Um, but we were college kids. Right. So, so you didn't like, know any better. We didn't know shit. Right. And you got, oh, well, there you go. Oh. There it is. <laughs> Ten bucks right there. They're two minutes. Is that in. really? Nobody told me these terms. Oh well, um, there you go. No, you didn't know the terms of the fifty-one percent either, and they had participating oh, yeah, so, preferred. Yeah, yeah. So, so you still. No, there, so <laughs> it was actually not participating preferred. It was a strange deal. Remember, LA didn't know how to do Silicon Valley deals at the right. time. They bought fifty-one percent common stock. Oh wow, that's weird. Yeah, totally weird. So they have fifty-one. They have controlling interest. They didn't understand the concept. Well, of preferred hold on. Shares. They had twenty-five and a half percent each. Ah. So it wasn't totally controlling. Right. So. Ovitz had two board seats. Um, Burkle had two board seats, and Common, or the you know the original founders, founders, had two board seats. Right. So it could get really weird real quick. No it, independent. Yeah. You know, well, weird. here's the thing that was interesting. So we signed an LOI for that deal. Right. And uh, sort of LA style, Ovitz and company were were sort of stringing us out because right. what was happening is our traffic was going like this. Server costs were going through the roof. We were running out of money. Ah. So they strung so you along to, get to try to get better terms. Ugh. I had to call Ovitz up at the end of the 30-day LOI and say, "Look, you know this deal didn't happen. We're going to have to go talk to other people." Right. Um, 
he hit three, the roof. Three days later. You don't say that kind of stuff to Mike Ovitz. Three days later, we got sued. Wow. For basically shopping the deal, which we hadn't done. We got sued for shopping the deal. The, the suit hits the Wall Street Journal. Gee, I wonder how they figured that out. Right. And then nobody else would invest in us. Ah, so Ovid says, I'll show you, kid, I'll sue you. Wow, crazy. Yeah, it doesn't matter what the suit was about. The bottom line is if Ovitz is suing us, nobody's right. going to touch us. Of course not. And so wow, then, that is a huge... So who do you, what entrepreneur do you know that was sued by an investor to take the investor's money? Right. That's and what happened. And the investor was... Yeah, so he finally he sends a lawyer letter or whatever, and you cave, take the money. We had to. We had no yeah. choice. Right. And, but uh, at least it was at the other terms that we well, originally negotiated. It's a great lesson to learn as a 22-year-old. Yeah. 22, 23? 22, 23, yeah, it was 22, I 22. think, at the time. Uh, you raise the money, you start building out, the service explodes. Yeah. And what people don't remember at this well, time Well, the service was, had already been exploding. Already exploding. But yeah. yes, you were correct. And the software was incredibly elegant. I remember using it and uh, when a, I was a journalist a at the time. great example, by the way, of yeah. you can have a killer product that is just killing it. Yeah. And if the fundamentals of the business are like, you know, the, a not cor- business aligned, structure, right? Corporate yeah. structure, yeah, of course, we'll rip a company in half. Yeah. Well, remember, we had, it was basically like six co-founders on Scour, okay? So you want to talk about right, right. structure being completely screwy? Right. Right? We had six dudes, all computer engineers. Right. Right? Who were running who this nev- company. And never worked and for the any, guy a who day was, in their life. The, the, <laughs> the president was decided based on who had taken a business class. Wow. <laughs> yeah, basically Like, we would make a decision. It could be like, should the paper clips be red or white? And it would literally take us four hours. Wow. Wow. Uh, pff, the folly of youth. So the, what people need to understand about this uh, software was, this is at the time when most people didn't even know how to play encoded files. That was even, in and of itself, a challenge. Like, yeah. people didn't have... Uh, maybe Windows Media Player had just started to come out or whatever, but this uh, real player was the dominant. No, this is all Winamp. No, no, no. Then. Well, Winamp and Win- and I would say probably real player were the two. Biggest. Winamp was dominant right. at the for time. Right, for MP3. For MP3. But then for video, you, it didn't. You, it was only real player for video. There right. was no yeah, other yeah. choice. There, you, you didn't, your computer did not have the ability natively to play a video file. No, time. no. But however, you had to movies, like get codecs and Yeah, crazy. you get codecs and all this kind of stuff. Ironically, the service had many people with. Uh, movies on it. So this yeah. was the first time movies started showing up there. That's right. And Scour was blamed for the piracy of movies for the first time. That was a very big deal. And the service, unlike Napster, which came 18 months later, supported any file type. It That's could right. be a PDF. You've got a good memory. It could be a movie. It could journals. be a doc. It could be an image. It, it could, could be, be anything. anything. And it was it the was first everything. multimedia search engine right. plus the first peer-to-peer app. It was both. Right. And it gets a tremendous amount of usage. People are fascinated by it, and it is the most advanced, essentially it's the most advanced piece of technology on the internet, I would say at the time, yep. um, or at least a piece of software. This is, that, remember, also at the time when there's only two browsers out, IE 1.0 and probably Netscape 2.0 or something, and people are barely I mean, using, three, I think maybe no, tables is I out. think we're at three or four. Maybe yeah. three or four. I think we're like but I think like, basically this is the time when Netscape, the, the way four, to organize actually. text on a page in HTML was tables. You would awesome. create a table to have Tables. a left-hand column versus a right-hand divs, column. Divs, baby. And you'd have divs. Like, that was the only way to set <laughs> Give up me the a, divs. to have two columns on a web page. I mean, it's barely, like, barely able to have images on it. Uh, and so, lo and behold, people start taking interest in this in the uh, Hollywood space. Yeah. And at some point, you get served with a lawsuit. Yeah, we get so... Where were you when you found out Okay, you were so being this served? is interesting. So we had... We had a couple of guys in New York. So I think it was Dan Rodriguez, who now runs Cario, which is a healthcare IT company that's killing it, which I'm also an investor in. Yeah. Uh, and I'm trying to remember who else was there. There were two guys. Basically, they were doing a New York tour of, um, they were talking to all the music companies, basically going, look, you know, what we know as iTunes today, we were pitching to the music companies. Right. Uh, because we knew that at the end of the day, we had to work with these guys. Yes, so their content. We do a tour with all of the, all of the music guys in New York, like you know Jimmy Iovine and like I mean the whole, the whole crew, and uh, and we had great meetings. Um, sure. We're like, hey, we're gonna work together. You know, like as so many. St- this is the first startup that's really going to these music right, companies so and saying, they look, weren't, they weren't afraid of it yet. Well, they sort of were, and mm-hmm. you'll see where the story goes. But basically, we're. Like, now, if a startup goes, yeah, we had a great meeting with a music company, I'm like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, right? of course Like, you whatever. Yeah. But at the Wait time, nobody knew. 
Right. And so we had great meetings with these uh, with these uh, uh, with these labels, and we go down to D.C. and we meet with a couple of senators. Wow. Uh, Orrin Hatch and Senator Leahy. Yeah. Because they were very interested in peer-to-peer -peer because it's, yeah. yeah. Well, what's technology. hilarious is Hatch is a is a, a musician himself. He's a musician and a songwriter. Yeah. Um, there you go. And he cares a lot about he that. It's pretty hilarious. The intellectual property. On yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I could go. We could do stories for hours. So I'll right. try to cut to the chase. Bottom line: great meetings with the senators. Okay. Feeling good. Guy named Manis Cooney, who you may or may not remember, ultimately worked at Napster, was chief of staff for Hatch. Okay. Walking. Walking the guys down the stairs, Capitol Hill. This is when you could actually walk on the steps. Yeah. And um, says, "Hey guys, uh, have you have have you talked to um, have you talked to the movie studios?" And we hadn't yet. We were we were actually setting those meetings up. Right. Um, and we're like, you know, no, no, we we haven't. But we're setting those meetings up. It's going to be awesome. The music companies was great. He says, "You really." should talk to the movie studios. Sort of like Deep Throat style. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're like, okay. Okay. Right. Get on the plane. The plane's about to take off. Phones start blowing up. Jack Valenti had called a press conference for the next morning. Whoa. Jack Valenti, president of the MPAA. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the movie studio organization that sues people, mm -hmm. essentially. Protects the rights of filmmakers. Yes, that's what I meant to me. That's what I meant. That's what I meant. Be clear. That's what I meant. And uh, called a press conference uh, about some lawsuit. They, they didn't provide a lot of details against Scour. Oh, wow. And uh, we're on a plane. We can't answer. You know, nobody mm -hmm. can answer. Anyways, um, the press conference happens. We haven't been served yet. Wow. So we have nothing to respond with. What right. do we respond to? Right, right. We're yeah. like, we don't know what they're talking about. So we look like idiots. Um, it's a good move. I mean, they know what they're doing. The next morning, we are at this, remember, this is 2000, and it, the, the, the boom is not over yet. Right. Next morning, we have a meeting with Tim Draper from Draper Fisher up sure. in Silicon Valley. And it was me, Dan, and at the time one of the most powerful venture capitalists. Yeah, that's this day still, still very well respected. I mean, Skype powerful. and like a whole yeah. bunch of other stuff, right? Yeah. Um, he throws on the table. We get there as an 8 a.m. meeting. He throws on the table like three newspapers. It's like the Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. New York Times, and like San Jose Almost Merc, like a movie. or it something is. like it's this. It's a great movie. This yeah. is the original Social Network. Yeah. He throws the the newspapers down, and we're on the front page of all of them. Like quarter trillion dollar lawsuit against Scour, right? <laughs> quarter by, trillion dollars by like not quarter per billion. billion. It's yeah, it's two hundred. There's per three file. commas. There's yeah. three commas. Dude, no, three right. comma club. So, so not billion, but Two, trillion. Two hundred and fifty billion. Two hundred and fifty billion. Quarter trillion. Two hundred and fifty okay. billion. Right. Okay. We're on the front page of all these things. It's like a crazy situation, but it's also boom days. Right. And he throws the newspapers on the on the table, and he goes, "I guess the valuation just went up." <laughs> and he meant it. Yeah. Because it was two thousand. Right. Sure. That it makes like sense. The RAAA and MPAA had just sponsored a fifty million dollar marketing campaign on behalf of Scour. Right. Exactly. And so now people are downloading the software like crazy. How many yeah. millions of people are using the software at that point when you got sued? <sighs> Low millions. Yeah. I mean, probably mid. I'm just guessing, sort of mid single digit millions. Yeah. But, but at, at the, the time, time that that's was. A Ton. Well, uh, there, there we is. go. Twenty in. That's at twenty-three minutes in. Um, <laughs> oh man, we're just getting started. The record's four. So <laughs> we're just getting started. Uh, quarter billion dollar lawsuit. Quarter 20, trillion. Quarter trillion dollar lawsuit. You, you're twenty-three, twenty-four years old. Um, on top of the world, uh, most powerful venture capitalists want to invest in the yeah, company. Yeah. And how do you sleep at night? Like, how do you, how do you function emotionally yeah. as a young person? given that disproportionate amount of insanity? Well, we were already, I mean, the crew, we were already kind of insane, and there was a lot of crazy stuff, especially with the Ovid stuff, because right. they represent all these artists, right? Right. They represent movies, you know, they do all of the stuff in entertainment. Right. They're funding the thing that is stealing from them. Right. Okay, so, so now people So are we had crazy stuff. I'm telling you just, I'm giving you the lighthearted stories. No, There's I know. bigger, deeper, gnarlier stuff. Yes, and uh, we'll get into that. Hopefully, um, there. So now you have Ovitz, who has sued you once to be an investor, 
And now Ovitz has massive egg on his face. Yeah. And he is a pretty vindictive guy, or was at the time. I mean, that's. Yeah. I mean, it was known in Hollywood that he was like, "You're taking these five, or, sure. reportedly, you're taking these five stores, stars for this movie, and you're paying this price. And if you don't, you're not getting these stars ever again. Let's go, right? I mean, that was the sort of. Yeah. He was gangster in that way. He was gangster. Yeah, he, I think he gangster, had power. Gangster is the appropriate term. Right. He had power and he leveraged it. Yeah. Uh, good for him. Um, and in your case, now he has massive egg on his face because. Mm. The people he represents, represents movie stars, directors, are saying, wait a second, you invested in this thing that is gouging our industry and is going to yeah. destroy us? Yeah. How, what does he say to you guys? Does he take ownership of the fact that he invested knowing what it was? Or did he say, I didn't know what they were doing? So basically, at some point, there was like, he pretended like he wasn't involved. Right. He pretended like... Um, he didn't know what was going on. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. Um, now, oh, my guys and my venture arm did that. We would have, it wasn't even like that. It was just, we had somehow fooled him. Ah. You know. What a D-bag move. Um, so so he, sues to, he sues to get in the company, yeah. won't close the deal, then sues to get in the company, and then. Uh, and then sort of puts distance. Yeah, puts distance between himself. It doesn't even go to bat for you guys. Yeah. All right, when we get back, I mean, I'm sure he'd claim that there, that he went to bat for us, but okay. but yeah. No, when we get back no. from commercial, I want to hear the inside story of the night you spoke at my event. <laughs> the inside story of the night you spoke at my event. And somebody's calling for Tyler. Hold on, it's important. It's Michael Ovitz. It's Michael Ovitz. <laughs> <laughs> he, he cut the stream. Oh, it's a nice guy. I like Michael. Maybe he's. he's well, anyway, I want to hear also. Have you ever spoken to Ovitz again? Yes. Okay, I want to hear that story as well. Yes. Now, since we're talking Actually, about it was Christmas. Oh, really? Yeah. Awesome. So now that we're talking about getting sued for $250 billion, which, as you can see, is a realistic thing to happen in our industry. It might be $250, $250 billion, $250 million, $25 million, $2.5 million, $250,000. The truth is, you're going to get sued if you do something successful in business. It happens all the time. Uber actually probably had a couple of legal letters sent to it in the history of its existence. Oh, yeah. It happens in business. Great people doing innovative things are a target. True or not true? True. And as a small business, it is your geary. It is your humble duty to protect your shareholders by having? Badass lawyers. And? Insurance. 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 Do you know insurance. I, yes. That's what I meant. Yes, insurance. But also badass lawyers. And you know who what? Who are paid by the insurance companies. Who are companies. paid by the insurance guys. Exactly. Anybody successful is going to get sued. And you know what? People don't have to be. I didn't even know where you're going with this. It's exactly. Amazing. Look over right. my shoulder, buddy. I see it now. We're doing this commercial break. It's amazing. Try to pay the bills here. I feel it. 15 years later, I'm still trying to pay the bills. Hiscox is the insurance company that small businesses love and use. Tyler's using it now. He just went online. Boom, boom, boom. Within five minutes, 10 minutes of filling out forms, he's got insurance. And it's as low as 22 bucks a month. Uh, da, 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 da. Buying insurance directly through Hiscox means it's quicker and it's simpler. You go to their website like any other good service should be. But hey, by the way, if you want to buy insurance from anybody else, they're going to send some dude to your place of business who's going to be like in a bad suit and he's going to give you a hard time. It's going to be like, blah, blah, blah. you're going to feel like you're talking to a used sales carsman, whatever. Hiscox, go direct. Buy right from the website. That is awesome. One size does not fit all. Uh, just answer the questions that are relevant to you and they give you a quote. In 15 minutes, have a tech business. Hiscox automatically includes copyright infringement coverage. Ding, ding, ding. They also don't overcomplicate things. Hiscox believes in transparency. All reviews, negative and positive, are posted online. Over 96% of customers say they'd recommend Hiscox to a colleague. That is ridiculous. 96% of people. I wonder if they would have given scour insurance. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you guys are pretty far out there. Uh, hey, go to hiscoxusa.com slash smallbiz and get a quote. HiscoxUSA.com slash smallbiz and get a quote. And by the way, if you say thank you to at Hiscox, um, I'm going to personally thank you on Twitter. So go ahead and thank Hiscox on Twitter. Yeah. And thank GoToMeeting too. Just, I love when people go thank people on Twitter because then the sponsors are like, oh, wow, that's fantastic. Okay. So now I was a journalist at the time running events. Yes. And I used to have a little thing out here I called the Digital Coast Dinner or whatever. Digital yeah. Coast 100 Dinner. And I would yeah. invite 100 people who either were important to my dinners. Yeah. It was pretty cool dinners. He used yeah. to come to them. Yeah. And it would be a who's who. Yeah. And Ovitz would come to them sometimes. Yeah. And I decided, hey, this guy Travis got some interesting stuff going on. I'm going. So maybe it's a month after. We've we'll, been sued. Maybe a month earlier. 
No, we'd what? We'd been we'd already been sued right, when we right, were there. Right. Sure. But I'm I'm wondering how long it had been between you being sued and being there. It might have been a month or two after you got sued. Yeah, it was two or three months, something like that. Yeah. So I said, Hey, come and do a little fireside chat. So he comes, 100, and you couldn't buy tickets to this event. It was, yeah. uh, it was invite only. I did it down at like Shutters or Casa del Mar, 100 people. I picked up the tab, you know, it was free to come. And uh, you're going to go on stage? I was at the, let's see, I was at the table. We were at the speaker's table, speaker's essentially. Table, yeah, right at the front. Uh, we're doing a fireside chat. We're about to do one. Yeah. And, uh, and a guy, I'm like, my heart is racing right now just to understand. It's pretty story. scary. Uh, one of uh, Michael Ovitz's, I mean, for lack of a better term, I don't know whether to call him a thug or... Goon? His... Heavy? His dude. His weight? I'm not sure if I should mention names. I'll, I'll right, whatever. That. No, just Tony. Vinny Bag of Donuts. It's fine. I think his name was Peter. Peter. Interesting. So he comes... Yeah, he comes, sort says, of hey. leans over my shoulder. Wow. And uh, basically tells me about how certain people in the industry have worked very hard to get where they're at. Wow. And that... Um, they don't need you? They really, you know, those people would definitely prefer that, that you know, some schmuck like me doesn't take them down. Right? Wow. And basically my life and my sort of physical, uh, I don't know how to call it, but basically... Your well-being. My well-being, my physical well-being in life were essentially threatened. Wow. Uh, at that at that table. Physical threat like a life like a like like I'm going you might wind up in a ditch. Yeah, there's a alley in the back. Right. If you f this up, you're going to get very familiar with it. Wow. Like but done in a much we, more a I think we you could pass on that. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm going to pay it. Yeah. Right. I can't deliver that message as well as it was delivered to me that night whispered over my ear from this guy, you this guy named Peter. Wow, this guy Peter threatened your life on yeah. behalf of my beloved. Holy yeah. cow. And so I, I think this is story of the year. This is the yeah, best is. story in the in 180 episodes of This Week in Startups. This is literally the best story ever told. And there have been some great stories how, told in this how, program. How many minutes before you're supposed to go on stage? Probably 10 or 15. Yeah, so he and gets so, on stage. So Dan Rodriguez and myself are right. going on stage, right? right? And, um, I mean, so here's what happened. That oh, happened. You're sitting at the table, and this is like a guy walks up to your table and leans over yeah. your shoulder and yeah. just... Gives you the message. Yeah. Wow. Because he, he knows he's going to get on stage, and this is going to be written right. about the next day. Da, 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 da. He, somebody on stage had just said, so coming up, we have a keynote. Hey, well, he, I mean, no, no, he knows. We're having dinner. Jason's at the table. Yeah, yeah. I'm at the like, table. Jason's doing the fireside chat. I'm doing, it's my event. Right. It was like one of my dinners, and there's a right. fireside chat after dinner, and we would interview people in the industry. You know, John Perry Barlow did one, he did one, Sky Dayton did one. It was just all different people yeah. in the industry doing interesting work. But he, you literally get threatened. And then I remember you came on stage and you looked pale. And I started asking him questions. And he's 23 at the time, 24. 23, 24. 23 yeah. or 24. And he's shaking. So I remember him like the, well, it was yesterday. He's like shaking. I'm like, I like to think I was smooth and collected. No. Maybe I wasn't. You were, you were clearly scared. And I was like, I think Travis might like have a breakdown up here, and so I started to like I pull you know as an interviewer I'm, I can recognize it. I pulled back on yeah. the questions, and I was like, so let's just talk about innovation in the industry because I didn't want to keep probing about sure. the lawsuit and stuff because I could tell he I was afraid you might well, start there was crying. Lawsuit, there was lawsuit. I'd like to see video to see. I'd I like wish to I had think this on I was video. totally money. Yeah. In I don't this think I but maybe these. not. No, I thought you were. Um, I thought you were about to cry. Like that's you were. Amazing. You were emotionally like frazzled. So what happened was? I mean, you took the threat seriously. I, yeah. So he did that. I basically acted tough to this guy. I said, yeah, yeah, whatever, you know. But the minute after that, I sort of go into a cold sweat. Sure. About 10 minutes later, I try to collect myself. We go on stage and, okay, how are we going to position this? How are we going to take truth and sort of lean it and bend it the way these guys need, but without compromising our integrity? It was, yeah. a, it was a tricky situation. Well, I mean, just to give you some context of what was going on at that time, according to reports, Ovitz, and Ante Pelicano, this was a whole thing he had, like private investigators working for him, people. If you this called, Ante Pelicano guy was doing some really. If you called one of Ovitz's, Ovitz or one of his guys, like on a, and you're calling from a cell phone, he's like, are you calling from a cell phone? And you're like, yeah. He's like, get on a f***ing landline. 34 minutes, we're in Jeez, for 40. it happened again. I'm going to have to pay for Does this reason. upset your audience, by the way? No, they story? love it. They okay. love it. They, right. they think it's hysterical. Right. So, I mean, it, but the problem is, the whole history of the, of the, of the swear drawer is, 
we have to take it takes post production now to edit out or we because Steve Jobs doesn't like cursing. I so do. you get your ex iTunes, you get explicit. You know, like for Steve Jobs, it's like he's got. So kids instead and, of f it's Fanny. That's five. You're that's in for fine. fifty bucks. That's fine. Jesus. All right. All right. So anyway, uh, what happens Sorry, to Steve. the company? You're, you're basically the company is sued into oblivion. Is that? So well, here's the thing. When we went when we went up to your fireside chat, we had been sued, but what we did is we had maybe a couple weeks before, a week before, which made this very timely event, is we had declared Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Now we were still operating, but Chapter 11 basically stays litigation, so this lawsuit basically goes away. Huh. It gets handled by a bankruptcy court in a matter of weeks instead of years. Wow. The copyright guys don't want copyright law determined in a bankruptcy court in two weeks. Mm -hmm. ah. So we're in this, pro this is the middle of the process. So basically what we did was we settled with them <clears throat> for a million dollars cash. Suit goes away, we turn the technology off, we sell the company for 10 million in a bankruptcy court. Wow, who bought it? Uh, and why? We had three bidders. We had Liquid Audio. Wow. We had Listen.com. Wow. And we had a company called Centerspan. So they still they wanted the peer technology. Because people yeah, they, felt what they wanted to do was they wanted to create a legal Napster. Right. And Napster had gone legal at a certain point with subscription well, services. Yeah, they were many not years yet. Later. They hadn't yet. They hadn't, but they were trying. Everybody was trying. Yeah, that's right. And the only person who was able to really get the music industry to do it was iTunes. iTunes, because he had already had the iPods out there. But it, and people but don't well, forget, remember well, the look. iPods weren't until 03 or 04, right? right. <clears throat> so there was nothing. The real player came out. You, and, you had players, but basically. Yeah. And a player could hold <clears throat> 10 songs. Just so people, just to put this in context. <laughs> it wasn't that bad. A real player could hold 10, no, the first version was first 8 version. megabytes. And I think it could hold 10 songs. <laughs> That's amazing. In AM quality. MIDI. <laughs> it was MIDI. And then you could, you could remove the uh, chip. It was removable chip, so people thought, well, they're just going to sell like SD cards or compact flash cards or whatever it was at the time. They just thought, oh, well, you'll just change cards yeah. to, for, per album. And then it started to hold 32 songs. And they used to sell it based on how many songs it could hold, not the megabytes. So it was like, this, is, this could hold 10 songs. This one could hold 30 songs. Yeah. The Rio, right? Was the Rio was the yeah. first one? Yeah. I gave everybody one as a gift. Which, of course, the music industry tried to sue Rio, right. saying this is an illegal device. Right. You can't it, have an MP3 player. It's illegal. It's illegal to have a player capable of playing an audio file. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. A and it was like, wait a second, Sony, hold on a second. Do you not have, and they, and they basically said, it doesn't have copy protection on it. So you can, they tried to sell that, to stop that device. Thank God yeah. the industry fought against yeah. them and won, obviously. But they wanted to the tech force industry. the tech, yeah, they, they wanted to force the um, mini disc. Uh, Sony mini disc technology, mean. which had some kind of encryption on it. Uh, so then you go on to found Scour, uh, the, uh, no, I'm sorry, you go from Scour to found Red Swoosh. Yeah. which was peer-to-peer -peer technology for businesses to the, offload the cost of the, uh, the, the, bandwidth. The, yeah, the idea was take those 33 litigants that sued us. I can't remember if it was 29 or 33, but I always say 33. Take those 33 litigants that sued us and turn them into customers with the same stuff that they sued us for. It was a revenge, it was a revenge company. Right. So I got these guys to pay me for the thing that they sued me for. It's pretty dope. So you go in and say, hey, you're trying to deliver yeah. movies on demand. Yeah. You're trying to deliver MP3s on demand. It's yeah. expensive. Use my technology. Yeah. And so when you take the face mm. off of peer-to-peer -peer app, you no longer interact with it. And all it is is a network stack mm -hmm. that, moves <clears throat> that moves data more efficiently. And so I'm trying to get them to pay me to save them money mm -hmm. on bandwidth. So now I click on a YouTube link. Mm -hmm. And instead of the file coming from a server, the, the video stream, coming from a a YouTube server over right. YouTube bandwidth. Instead, that video stream would come from 30 peers nearby that already have. Does that YouTube have already use that, that video. now, or they just screw it? Google's got no. enough bandwidth; they use no. peers. YouTube do doesn't use it, but there's a ton of companies that do. Right. Yeah. And, and how come this technology is never? Is it because bandwidth costs plummeted so much that we don't need them? No, the technology took off. I mean, Akamai bought us ultimately. Yeah. Right. Um, I think we're we're on like well over 100 million desktops, maybe 150 million, wow. something like this. And so and people don't even know they're using it when they Well, it you know, that's a network stack. Like, do right. you know what TCP stack sits on your no, machine? No, right, right. right. So, wow. It's basically, yeah, it's amazing how the innovation comes full circle. Yeah. Uh, so you wind up, and I think Mark invested in that company. Mark You Cuban, had met yeah. Mark back in the day. I had, yes. Yeah. And so you wind up getting Mark Cuban as an investor in Red Swoosh. Yeah, that, but let's just be clear. I did Red Swoosh. I was about four or five years too early to market. Right. And so I, I call it blood, sweat, and ramen. Blood, sweat, and ramen. Explain. Yeah. 
Uh, what that means is when you don't pay yourself for four years, oh. right? And it, you know, one of those years you live at mom's house. Wow. You're not getting the ladies. No. At all. Not much. No. Um, you. Do it's, well, it's not do your friend, does your friend and you ramen. want some fish sticks or something? <laughs> your mom's going down to the basement. <laughs> No, we're good, Mom. <laughs> you sure you don't want fish sticks? <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, no, you just never, you never brought the girl home to. You never brought the girl home, right. You're like, we'll go to your place. Yeah, exactly. So basically, you don't pay yourself. Mark yeah. floats you a couple hundred So what G's. happens is eventually, I was in a, a Mark head. We were on, a, we were on the Follist, this, uh, this listserv. It's yeah. copyright and technology and how they come together. Yeah, the Folip, Fa Fo, fa, P H O. Fa. It was all the music industry people for a while. Is yeah. it still going on, the Folip? I think so, but I've unsubscribed. Yeah, it's too much noise. Um, so he went on this list, and at some point was like, peer to peer is, is lame. Peer to peer right. is crap. Right. Something along these lines. I, I didn't want to put another $10 yes, in there. Yes, no problem. And, um, and everybody, I mean, the list, we've been on it for years. Like, everybody knows who I am and what I'm doing. They're like, oh, snap. Like, right. what's he going to do? Right. And Mark and I went on, like, a week-long sort of, I don't want to call it a, a, a list or a flame, flame war. war, but it was a flame war. It was, it was a debate. Back and forth debate. Yeah. You know how Mark rolls, right? Yeah, you know, Mark will tell you that's BS, and he'll yeah. be wrong sometimes. And he's down for and that. He will, and he'll admit when he's wrong. And when we got to the I end of it. I just had one of these with Mark over education stuff. When we got to the end of it. Yeah. He sent me a private email saying, I'm interested. Let me invest. Now, I was in the middle of the blood, sweat, and ramen. Right. And I'm like, I don't have anything for him to invest in. Right. And I'm like, I'm like, Mark, no, nah, you know, we're not taking investment right now. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, but eventually, like, I ran out of money, uh, and my last engineer left. And there were a bunch of things. Mark and I were talking about. I was working on this AOL deal, and there was a lot right. of stuff going on. But basically, Mark was a real angel. Right. Like he saved my company. Awesome. Basically. Then you wind up a couple years later selling it to Akamai. Sold it to Akamai. Yeah. Pretty good deal. Yeah, pretty good deal. I mean, yeah. I only raised 1.7 total. Right. Uh, the purchase price was basically 20. It was it was yeah. 19 essentially. Yeah. Uh, the incentives on top were about four or five. Wow, great. So, so that we call that a, a double triple. Yeah. And that sure. will set you up to do whatever you want in life. Sure. Which is enough. I always tell young entrepreneurs if you get a chance to put a double or a triple up on the yeah. on the scoreboard, you take it. Score runs. That's what wins baseball games. And then you start Uber. Right. Now Well Uber. actually so I did angel investing for You did angel investing, right? Because you were I was in burned spring. out. I did ten years uh, of P to P. I was toast. Yeah. I was toast. It was like 10 years of fighting. We'll just yeah. Give you I mean, a little it was, bit of gray hair going on there now. All, I call these swoosh hairs. Yeah, swoosh hairs, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so then, um, how, what, was the f what was the founding of Uber? Okay, so. Hey, tell me that story. So, good. Because I think this is your billion dollar company, I'll be totally honest. I'm an angel investor, so I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. kind of biased, but. I mean, I, 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 I agree with you. Yeah, I think it's a billion dollar company. <laughs> so, we, so let's see. So, uh, Garrett Camp, CEO sure. of StumbleUpon, and myself, like basically, we were we we're between gigs. He was still working at eBay because they had acquired StumbleUpon. Yeah. He hadn't. And by it working, out, you mean doing getting nothing. a salary? Yeah. And doing nothing. Yeah. Um, I had <laughs> just left Akamai. Right. And we were sort of talking about ideas. What are we going to do next? Yeah, yeah. Riff. We were at Le Web in Paris. Sure. Every Le Web, I rent you know a large apartment, like four bedrooms, and just have friends stay. Sure. Right. So we were just hanging out in Paris for several days. Had a bunch of friends there. And we're riffing on ideas right. in the late night, like every yeah. night. And you know, it was all sort of lifestyle type ideas. Right. Um, and his was like, and we're in San Francisco, he's like, it's hard to get a freaking taxi. Hmm. Like it's hard to get a taxi in San Francisco. Only. Impossible. Yeah, you're stranded, game over. Yeah, it's not New York. And he's like, you know, why don't we just buy a few limos, hire a few drivers, and you know, have a little iPhone th app where we can just push a button, and a car appears in five minutes. Great idea. And oh yeah, we'd of course have to have a parking garage too, right? Yeah, because, of course you do. So it started out as like, let's do this lifestyle let's business. Let's, it was basically like, let's share a driver. Yeah. It, it was it like was a, a jet share, share time share for, for drivers. And I'm like, it's a genius idea. He calls me. He calls me at some point. Like we'd been riffing on this for a while. He calls me. He's like, Travis. I've got the papers for the parking garage. I'm like, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it, because I was just very against owning the assets, hiring the drivers, right. you know, parking garage. What I like to say is that Uber is, is very classy and it's very efficient. Right, Garrett, value. Garrett brings the classy and elegance, like that's his part of it. 
Yeah. I bring the efficient. The value. I bring the gnarly math efficiency sort of aspect to the business. Well, and the business is what? The, biz the business is on-demand town car service. Like I push a button on my iPhone or Android or even SMS, I push a button and in five minutes a car appears. I can see it coming to me. Uh, when it arrives, I get buzzed. I, it, Uber has a So on the map, it shows you... A car coming to you. A car coming to you on a Google map, yeah. basically. Yeah. And it tells you how many minutes, the driver's name, yeah. and my billing information is already in there. Yeah. And my phone number's in there so I can That's text right. with the driver and along the way. And we put iPhones in all the cars so we see the exact route it was taken. When you get to your destination, you just walk out of the car. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to worry about tipping. It's all included. It's all included. And the price is double the cost of a, of a Lincoln Town car. 50% no, no, more no, for all that convenience? No, it's twice the price. In San Francisco, it's twice the price of a taxi. In New York, it's 1.75. In Seattle, it's 1.5. So it's cheaper than a Lincoln Town Car normally is, even though you're getting all that it's convenience. It's 90% cheaper wait, than a Lincoln Town Car. But, but you it, get a Lincoln Town Car. But shouldn't it be more expensive for all that convenience? <laughs> um, Why is it not more, more expensive to get that? Because I, I would pay more for that service. Totally. Than you would pay for a normal totally. carry or a music car. If we car. only wanted to deal with wildly successful entrepreneurs, yeah. then you're right, we would charge more. But the point is, is we want to have more Ubers in a city than there are taxis. We are wow. going to dominate right. every city that we go into. And so you have to find the right price point to make that happen. So actually you want to bring Lincoln Town Car Service down to the top half of taxi service. We're going to price discriminate. So we'll have high-end products and we'll have like, you know, cheaper products, right? Yeah. So like you can get an iPhone that's really expensive, that has all the memory, all the action, and you can get you know, you can get an iPhone. Last year's matter. Last year's. You can get the three, sure. three, 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 three GS, four. right? Yeah. And so we're going to do the same thing. Ah, got it. So now the drivers, when it used to be called Uber Cab, but now it's just Uber.com, to be clear. It's just Uber. You yeah. showed me this, and the first thing I said to you was, Are you raising money for this? I have to angel invest this. And then I said, Please come to the open angel forum. That's and you're right. like, We're, we're going to close this round. I said, Just come for, please, because yeah. I need to have good companies there. And I, yeah. it'd be a great win for me to just be able to say that you came. So I appreciate yeah. you coming. So you yeah. He's given the presentation. I don't know if you were there for this, this one. Was dog Patch Lab. Yeah, Dog Patch yeah. Lab. I just write like 25 or 50, and I'm just like, I, now that's the new thing at the open agent firm. People yeah. just write how much they want to invest, and they just hold it up on a piece of paper. Right. Like, it's a, like right. it's a muscle car auction or something. Yeah. Um, so you wind up getting a bunch of investors. Top wow. tier angel investors. Like so give us some names. At that event. At the event. I think every single four people at the event. Oh, that everybody. wanted in. Not everybody, everybody got, got in. in but yeah. I, mean, I think you're the only one at the event I think that got in. in. Yeah, Actually, no, there's a first round capital guy there. Yeah, first round was there, yeah. Though I ultimately ended up working with Rob Hayes from first round, but uh -huh. they did get in. Yeah, so it was great. you and uh, first round. Yeah. So who are the other angels? In it? Oh, man. So Alfred Lynn, CEO sure. of Zappos. Wow. Uh, Sean Fanning. Awesome. Um, man, I'm going to forget because there's so many yeah, awesome but now people. You are Mitch in the, Kapoor. I mean, the list goes on. You're at the point in your career where if you come up with a decent idea, Yeah. Forget about a great idea like this, but a decent yeah. idea. Yeah. You have a line of people ready to invest, isn't it true? When you are a successful entrepreneur, you can get your first round of investment fairly easily. And by fairly easily, it's done. I mean, you yeah. just meet with somebody and say, here's what I'm doing, and they'll send a check. Yeah, and you also have people you've already made money. Right. And so how do you know, it, how do you know? Like Mark wanted in, but we know how Mark rolls. He likes a little bit of discount. He likes a deal. He might, well, you know. He likes a you. real deal. So I'll give him a deal. And I have no issue with that, but, right. but he, you know, but yeah. Yeah, you're negotiating and then, yeah, well, listen, he's got a certain thing. He wants a good yeah. deal. And no, I respect yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so now you, how do you know as an entrepreneur who's that successful that you can raise money at any time at almost any valuation if you actually have a good idea or not? Because you need to have a Mark Cuban or a Mitch Kapoor or whoever it is or Sean Fanning say, hey, I don't think this is a or good idea. Or Jason Calcanis. Well, whatever, I'm leaving myself off that list. I'm not successful with those guys. But basically, those guys who've changed the world in a major way, um, you need them to validate the idea more than you need their money. When, I mean, look, if you are a successful entrepreneur, you don't you don't need those guys, right. really. You could do it yourself. Yeah. But the reason you're taking it is because you want them on your team. And don't you want them to tell you, this isn't a good idea, or I think it's a good idea, but X, Y, and Z? You're looking to them for some kind of validation of the idea? I, don't, I never no? feel that. No? I never feel that. OK. I never feel like so investors why you... are the guys I need to validate my idea. But it is good when they say, hey, I like the idea. Sure, it makes your life easier. Right. It's confirming. Yeah. It okay. makes your life easier. Basically, but it doesn't mean it's going to win or lose. So, uh, how many times have you seen overhyped companies just? Of course, of like, course. It just 
It it's, happens it's all just, the time. Yeah, so it means I don't look, I don't look, I don't, it's not because I have some philosophical issue with it, it's just, that's just not how I do it. Right, so Uber, uh, you, you move from Uber taxi to Uber. Yeah, because, because you the get city sued. of San Francisco and the state of California said shut down. Right, because. I mean, here's a cease and desist order, shut down. Right, because they don't understand that you're not using yellow cabs. They don't even research they, it that they much. They understand, I mean, the bottom line is that, you know, the, you know, there are incumbents in any market space sure. who have issues when new guys come in. Right. They lobby, you know, local government to sort of take the, you know, take them out. Right. I mean, right. that's the first now, in, response. That's yeah. how you initially but, respond. But I mean, in terms of the the, the livery cars, the black town cars, yeah. I mean, they're called livery. Livery, and it, it's interesting. Livery is a New York term. Oh, it's a New York term. Um, we can go into it. It's very interesting. interesting. So each, you, you have to basically decide in each market if it's going to be worth the hassle. But generally, for the Lincoln Town cars, in my experience, they already allow you to text them or email them or, uh, or book them through other ways in some cases, having used some of the services. Nobody gives you five minute pickups. But nobody gives you five minute pickups. I mean, and nobody but gets you there's like There's no I law can just see against using coming. your iPhone to get a Lincoln there's Town not. car. There's not. Look, we feel like we do not. But a go yellow can't pick up, right? A yellow can't be arranged, generally speaking. Is that the A yellow cab can be in San Francisco. You can dispatch a yellow cab. You can. You call. But. This is a public information. If you are in San Francisco, 72% of all dispatch calls on a Saturday night to Yellow Cab go as no-shows. The car does not show up. Uh, Why? Because the driver who gets dispatched is on his way maybe to pick you up, right. and somebody flags him down. And that driver's got to feed his family. Right. He's got to take the... the, the, the like fill that car, butts and seats. Right, exactly. That's how he gets paid. Right. He can't wait to maybe pick you up. Yeah. Uh, so you solve that huge problem, yeah. um, and it's efficiency and elegance. I'll right? tell you that. I'll tell you when I realize it's going to be a billion-dollar company. Well, the real, the interesting story here. What, how do you respond when the city of San Francisco initially says you got to shut down? Um, because you've well, kind see, of, the great thing is I've seen this before. Yeah, I was about yeah, to say, like, I've seen this I'm like, oh man, I <laughs> got a playbook for this. Right, right, right. Let's exactly. do this thing. Right. <laughs> I'm like, like when that happened, it actually for me felt like a homecoming. Yeah, <laughs> like I'm like I'm home now. Wow, we've done something so disruptive that people are calling and not their just lawyers. That, but it was just like that <laughs> special place that like I know how to operate in this right. world. This is your zone. You don't yeah. break a sweat because of this now. So you get on the yeah. phone with the lawyers. You, you talk to the people at City Hall and you work it all out. It was well. It was basically lawyers. It was writing sort of like our response to it. Right. Um, we basically had a publicly blog post. crafting that basically. Well, we we craft it. It hadn't gone public yet. We knew ultimately, well, we didn't know, but we were waiting for it to go public. Arrington breaks it. Right. Like, I don't know, four or five days later. We had a blog post ready to go. So we're right. like, post it. We had the right thing. We got it up. And look, the city, the, in California, cities regulate taxis, the state regulates limos. Okay. In fact, the Public Utilities Commission, the guys who regulate your water and your power, also regulate your limos. Okay. And so the cities do not have jurisdiction really over us. Right. So they sent us a cease and desist, but there's not much that they can really do right. in the state of California. Right. Different cities, it's different. Right. Um, there's a conversation with the state about are we Orbitz or are we American Airlines? Right. Ah, got it. You own and operate or do you just... Yeah, should we be permitted as a limo company where right. they take a percentage of our revenues and there's certain regulations? Or are we orbits? You're just sending them a customer. Yeah. And, and the, the truth is you're just sending them a customer. We're sending a customer because the regulations, if you look at them, it's like give your drivers drug and alcohol tests, inspect your equipment, insure your equipment, right? do workers' comp. Like, I don't have drivers to give. Like, they're not my drivers. They're not your drivers. Like, you're I can't give them a drug and an alcohol test. Right. I can't they're, inspect they're the equipment. It's not mine. They turn on their iPhone. I can't insure it. The driver experience is they turn on an iPhone. Yeah. They've signed up with you guys. Yeah. They get a call, they get rated, that's it. Yeah, they basically get a request through the iPhone. That's it. And they accept or not. Right, and you yeah. take a piece of that. We take a piece of that. It's pretty simple. And all the drivers I've spoken to say they love it. Yeah. They're making more money from it. Oh, I yeah. interview every one. Yeah. And then at the end, I tell them, do you know Travis? And they say, yeah, I know Travis. I had him here in New York. You actually drive in all the taxis with all the drivers or most of them? I mean, anytime I'm getting around San Francisco yeah. or New York, I... And they know you're the CEO. A lot of times, lot of I, times. I try to hold off, like, see what they say without yeah. it. Uh, then they go, "Are you the Travis?" Yeah. I'm like, I, I'm Travis. I am the Travis. I'm the Travis. The Travis. But um, it turns out that their behavior and driver and passenger behavior yeah. 
you know, on both sides of the equation can be yeah. bad at times. People are frustrated. Traveling can bring the worst out in people. Sure. And the, it's a very stressful drive for the drivers. I believe that your product is making the behavior go up. Yeah. Because the first thing that happens is you learn the driver's name. So now yeah. he's a human. Yeah. You rate the driver. So the driver knows that you have some power. Yeah. And you driver know that. rates you. The driver rates me. Driver also rates you. I didn't know that part. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So if I'm an a-hole. Yeah. He could just say one star, and then can he put a comment of why? He, we, he doesn't have the ability to comment directly, but, he but they send us you. emails and stuff like that. Right. Or we'll ask if like somebody gets rated at one, we're like, what happened? Ah, oh, really? Yeah. So now it's safer for the driver, because yeah. they know a who this person is. A lot safer because we have the credit card number. People do not understand like how unsafe it is for drivers. Oh, they get killed, they get robbed, like, they get beaten. late night. Sure, drunk know, people. Drunk people, et cetera. I mean, it's a craft. Right. to be a good driver, and people don't necessarily understand that. It's also bad for the drivers in New York. They've all been sold down, at least the taxi drivers, they've been sold down the river by their unions. They don't get, they used to have Blue Cross Blue Shield, they used to have two weeks vacation, Look, they get nothing now. It's, the, the whole it's career's a tricky, been destroyed. It's a tricky situation, right? So it's like, in New York, with taxis, it's fixed supply. Right. The supply rarely, if ever, changes. If you look at a graph, of the number of medallions, taxi medallions in New York for the last 60 years, it's like a flat line. Right. With like a little blip. Yeah, they at the get a couple more to get. You know, get but released. it's a flat line. What does a medallion cost so in New York now? Three Fixed supply, fixed pricing that has to be approved by the city. Right. Okay, like this is not I mean, a free this, market. This is not a free market. Right. This Sunday should else. be cheap and uh, five so o'clock should got, be expensive. You've got, yeah, you've got demand and supply issues because. You guys of have it. experimented with different pricing at different times, correct? Yeah. And yes. how has that gone? Explain it. It's amazing. Really? How so? Um, well, look, uh, dynamic pricing. We were really scared. We did dynamic pricing for the first time New Year's Eve. Hmm. Uh, basically, we're twice the price of a taxi. We doubled that. Why? Because we needed a secure supply. We needed to make sure there were enough cars right. on the system for New Year's Eve. The only way to do that is to make sure that we're better than their alternatives for making money that night. Right. That's number one. Number two, we have to do what's called las what I call lassoing in uh, demand. Is hmm. that on a New Year's Eve or, an, or a Halloween or you know, yeah. a big music festival, Demand just goes nuts, right. and it gets to a situation where people are pushing the button, and they have to do it like 20 times to get a ride. Right. So you raise the price to last one demand. This is classic economics, right? Right. And so that's people push the button. Supply. They say, "I'll walk," or they just yeah, they just it's too expensive can't get a ride. Me. So instead of an average ride yeah. on New Year's Eve of 20 bucks, it's 40 bucks. Yeah. So the average ride on New Year's Eve, I think, was 50 dollars. Right. But well worth it. You're it's your big you're get, night. You're not getting out. I mean, you're yeah. not getting you're not getting anywhere other than walking that night. Right. And or you're renting a limo for the night for a thousand dollars. That's right. Twelve hundred. Yes. Twelve hundred for the night in San Francisco right. if you want a limo. Yeah. So you're either twelve hundred or with Uber, you, you're two hundred for four trips. Yeah. I and mean, you're I, you're covered. And, and when you when and did it work? Did people have to wait or no? No. You priced it perfectly. It, it was beautiful. Wow. And, we and thought, the drivers were happy. Drivers were really happy. I mean, they Double. made yeah, they made a lot of money, and it was safe, and it was you know, they just they did right, good that business. Is a, the safety is a big thing. Yeah. So now I look at Uber, and the thing that comes to mind, the reason, I mean, aside from investing, because one more thing, you, one more yeah. thing, New Year's Eve this year, we're gonna have like eight cities. Wow. Like hey, how many cities? It was in crazy. Now? Last New Year's, we got we got a, we rented a place in Marina del Rey. I had the whole team there, and like it was like lockdown. Mission Control in Marina del Rey. Yes, here. Yes. Oh, why here? Uh, because we were working from the 23rd of December through the 2nd of January. Ah, so might figured. as well. We, let's get a house on the beach and like beautiful. Let's, and this year we're going to have eight cities. Eight it's cities. It's going to be like to? screens you everywhere. You raised a B round or an A round? What, what, did, what did you? We raise? raised an A round. It was 11 and a half from Benchmark. Wow. Bill Gurley or who? Bill Gurley. Yeah. Really? I was just hanging out with him this weekend. I also spent time with uh, with uh, Matt Kohler. Yeah. Bill's amazing, Matt's amazing. Yeah. What a great friend. Why'd you pick Benchmark? Because they're the best. Really? Definitely. Really? For you, pound for pound, best VC? Pound for pound, best VC. This is the all... great situation that happens after your first time around or when you have a great idea is right. that Why are they the you best? get to choose who you work with. It's pretty amazing. You can like have the standard of excellence that does not get compromised. It's a wow. beautiful thing. Right. If you they're have the a great best. idea. They're the best. It's not even a close call. Really? Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, and why did you pick them specifically? I mean, aside from them being the best. Uh, well, it's, it's you had a lot of term sheets. I know that. You had a lot I mean, of interest. Literally, you got better terms from other people, or did they match your best terms? 
Benchmark was incredibly aggressive to keep other terms from getting on the table. Oh, really? They just said, screw it, like, whatever. I mean, now, was people, it reported people, valuation? People could, yeah, it was reported. It was a post million? of 60. Post of 60. That's yeah. incredible. So you raised 10 million, wow, for only 15% of the company. Yeah, like 20% yeah, of the company. Yeah, so. 18%, whatever. Yeah, so, yeah. What wow, was I going to say? Like, yeah. they, benchmark made it very. They made it very difficult for me to go and make the rounds. Let's what, put that. Yeah. Way. So uh, I did one meeting at Benchmark. It was a full partners meeting, and they they made sure I stayed in that room until it was done. They, well, no, they basically met after the partners meeting, right? Or after I pitched, uh -huh. they're still in the partners meeting. You're in the they lobby. They put me in another room. Uh, yeah. They tell the receptionist, "Don't let this guy leave." Uh, <laughs> and then they come and they're like, "All right, let's talk about the deal." Okay, perfect. So now, what's the future of Uber? Just 100 cities and that's it? Uh, or is it, hey, Cosmo.com is a really interesting business, let's start delivering ice cream? That's interesting. So first, let's kill the transportation thing. Let's crush it, right? right. Let's do that big. And it means, exp basically I have two things when it comes to that. One is replication. Right. Like, let's replicate to every major city in the world. It's not just US, it's everywhere. Right. We're gonna be in you Europe, we're gonna be in Asia. You do have popping up now, right, in Germany? My taxi, yeah. whatever. I mean, there's a couple folks out there, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a good idea. They're going to be competitors, um, and we will kill them. Not with a great name like Uber. That's true. Right. Not, not yet. Yeah. Um, but uh, so it's replication, but then it's domination. Right. And that means going deep in a city, more Ubers in a city than there are taxis. Those are the what does two that mean, more Ubers? More Ubers, more cars that are on the Uber system than right. there are taxis. That's what you mean when you say Ubers, yeah. not customers, but oh, more, yeah. more drivers. That's I'll tell right. you when I knew this was going to be a billion-dollar company. We get to, uh, usually I take carry, right? So for a while I was using carry car service. It's like, is that the best or second best? Uh, I mean, they, Music, they provide carry. high quality service at a, at a very high premium. Right. So I've been using it. Then I look at the bill at some point, and I'm just like, the you know what? jacked. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's $130 to go from LAX to my house. And it's thirty dollars to park in short-term parking. If I'm there for, if I'm the trips less than four days, it's a, cheaper for me to park my car in short-term parking. And I'm like, so then I start taking yellows, and I'm like, I just screw this. I'm going to be frugal, right? It's like, a, you know, whatever. A little, a little austerity measure, right? Self-imposed. So I start using <laughs> the yellow cabs. Then I just start like, I'm wasting money. I have this thing about money. I have a very yeah. complex relationship because I grew up poor. Anyway, um, so I start <laughs> taking the yellows, right? And then everybody's like, you, you know what? You're showing up late for a meeting. Stop taking the yellows. You know, like there's a line sometimes. We need you to be where you need to be. It's, it's creating a little bit of a problem. Um, and we get to, I don't know if you were here for that, but we, one of the first trips to San Francisco when, after Uber was out, you started supporting the airport. Yeah. So I said, I'm gonna, that's it, I'm using Uber at the airport. Yeah. Boom, I do it. The guy's like 10 minutes away. I'm like, okay, screw it, I'll use my laptop. I'll wait the 10 minutes. He comes. We started, we started in the taxi line for a second. We was, started in the taxi line. It was kind of crazy and, and was like, wait a minute, I think Uber comes to the airport now. Guy comes. Because the, the time we were before in San Francisco, he said, like, we're going to start going to the yeah, airport. Yeah, it wasn't originally airport service, correct? It, you could always get it. Like, you could always try. Right, it, it just wasn't. rarely would happen. So I At do it. some point, we just got so many hundreds of cars in the city that it was like, it just spread everywhere. You don't give them their iPhones, right? It's up to them to get them. We give them their iPhones. Oh, you pay for their iPhones? Yeah, they you lease. pay the monthly service? The, yeah. Oh, they lease it? It's essentially leased. Right. How much do they have to pay for the iPhone and everything, the whole package? 50 bucks? I mean, look, we are able to get the price down. I mean, it's under, I think it's under 40. Oh, wow. But, but not just that. Like, let's put this in the context. We have drivers making $3,000 a week. Right. Like, so it's fine. Who cares? Who cares? Right. But who cares? It, it is a nice thing that they don't have to think about. I got to go get an iPhone. It's like, oh, my yeah. iPhone shows up. Well, it's one platform for us. We know what it is. Right. Like, we it don't just, have like weird different 3GS versus this versus yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It's just one platform. Um, the guy comes up to pick us up. I'm sort of like recognize the guy, and I look. I know he's got a carry folder. I said, "You a carry driver?" I said, "Yeah." I, said, I think he took me last time. He said, "Yeah, I think I did take you last time." Yeah. I take a carry thing to the city. It was 50, 60 bucks. No. Yeah. And it's normally 100. 65. 65. It's normally 140. Yeah. yeah. 130, 140 for carry to take me to the city. I said, "I got the same driver for half the price. <laughs> the literally same driver." And he was nicer to me because I was using Uber. Because I mean, it was going into his pocket. Ah. Uh, I see. So he keeps it back. That's his, it's his business now. Right. You're now dealing with a businessman, not an employee. And because, because those people didn't lock those guys down as full-time employees and made them independent contractors, that gives you access to them. Kerry has a network of drivers. Right. Right, just like we have a network of drivers. Right, so now it's like, are those guys that carry 
absolutely infuriated but by But Perry it. takes a big chunk, and they charge it's an old much. business, and they've had to really extend their margins, and they've done it through So month. are they coming to you saying, can we make an, uh, a deal with you? And, uh, and We haven't heard from Kerry. Right. But there are, are, are the a lot other ones? Of, there are a lot of large, big companies. That, like Music, some of that. Are they coming to you saying, hey, do a deal with us? And you're just like, eh, whatever. Yeah. Basically. I mean, well, you know, look, we'll always listen to these guys and right. hear what they have to say. It's, you know, it's an interesting situation where there there's, could be an element of co-opetition, right. but you have to do that carefully. You enable them and then split the fee. Yeah, I mean, in San Francisco, it's very difficult for an existing player to come and try to play with us because we're dominating and we're getting bigger every day. There are markets where it's early enough where it could be interesting. Like it could accelerate. Could our accelerate supply. you into the south or something, and you just yeah, or accelerate supply in some fashion. Right. Like New York is an interesting supply situation, so we might partner with a big. How is New York going? Because everybody said you'd yeah. fail there. Yeah, we're definitely not failing. Um, Why do people think you're going to fail? Because they feel like there's ta taxis everywhere. But I'm. If you're a black town car person, you don't take taxis because you don't like the smell. Yeah, I mean, or the experience. But here's maybe, maybe. I mean, but you can get in a livery car in New York and have a pretty crappy experience too. That's true too, but it's generally not going to smell. Okay, fair enough. Here's the bottom line: is that um, I talk to folks and they're like, "Well, yeah. I have options, and I can get picked up, and you know, yeah, all the this subway stuff. is a backup. You know, I've just yellow got cab options. Is a backup. Everything from like yellow cab to black car to subway to bus to whatever, right? Right. It, it is designed but, but for here, But here's the thing, right? I say, I say, no, there are taxis everywhere in New York. This is, I, I get their defenses. I say, I know there are taxis everywhere. I said, and, and you're tied to a New Yorker, which, Jason, yeah. you're, you're a New Yorker. Sure. So then I would say, but tell me about those times when it's difficult to get a taxi. Yeah. And you talk to a New Yorker, you say it like that. Oh, yeah. And then the next thing you hear is like, 7th Avenue between 20th and 35th from 7.15 a.m. to 8.45 a.m. You're screwed. Never. Yeah. Tribeca, early afternoon, game over. Alphabet City, north of Houston, forget about it, right? right? And they just start railing yeah, off these dead things. Zones. Dead what zones and dead times. You have pain points spread across the city right. at different times that I think if you just added those pain points, you're talking about a half a billion dollar market. Right. That's where you start. But then you talk about shift change in New York. Right. Then you talk about rain. Right. Then you talk about Brooklyn. Right. Like each of these problems is like hundred million dollar problems. And the, and the problems Uber is designed for. Yeah. Now how can you And then the, of course you got the elegance on top. So I talked to somebody. Yeah, and I I got to tell you one of the most convenient things for me is not having to worry about having money on me. Yeah. Not having to go through the whole rigmarole that when you take your credit card out in a cab in New York, mm -hmm. guys like, oh, you want to pay by credit card? It's broken. Oh, it's broken. And I'm like, well, I don't have cash. Well, we have to go to an ATM. I'm like, well, go ahead, take me to an ATM, but you're turning the meter off. I mean, I literally go through this dance with people. Yeah. I mean, the drivers in New York are hyper aggressive. Right. Just to get yourself out of that is worth a right. 50% premium. And so then the other side of this, right? So there's the pain points, of course. Yeah. You get stranded. But the other side of it is, you know, there had this friend, she she was like, eh, you know, she was still not, she's like, yeah, eh, on the fence. I, you know, I go, Wait a second, you've got a Louis Vuitton bag. I'm like, yeah, I remember her whole argument was that taxis are ubiquitous and they're cheap yeah, and yeah. they're everywhere. I go, why don't you get a freaking paper bag? Yeah. They're ubiquitous and they're cheap. Yeah, why are you carrying your stuff in a Louis Vuitton bag? I don't understand. She's yeah. like, ah, oh, that's clever, nice. Yeah, that's clever. I said, wait a second, don't you have a deli like at the bottom of your apartment building? She goes, yeah. I said, why do you go to restaurants? I don't yeah. understand. What are you yeah. doing? You just go to the deli. It's downstairs. It's efficient. Yeah. It's convenient. And Better it's cheap. Experience. experience. It's ubiquitous. Yeah. Right. So there's the efficiency part. You got to solve a pain point, but there's the elegance and just sort of style part of it. So tell me about the distractions. What are the things that people want you to add to Uber? Because I've been oh wow I've been on you a little bit about this. I'm trying. You know, as an angel investor, I, you know, and your friend, I don't want to tell you what to do, but um, <laughs> I know Why don't for you me. Tell me. Yeah. I want to hear what you have to say. No. This is the thing. I am. I was always obsessed with Cosmo. And Cosmo was w working in certain cities. Yeah. They overexpanded, and that's why they failed. Joseph Park, never heard from him again. I always thought that was very weird. Hey, Joseph Park, come on the program. And also, I mean, you're such a talented guy. Why did you just drop out? I don't understand that when talented guys drop out. Mm -hmm. You notice that? Like some guys who were in the, the original class of whatever, 98, 99, they just, they did like one company, and then they went to work for other people, and they never yeah. tried again. Yeah, it's interesting. Joseph some Park people, was this guy. Some people can't, they can't, they can't keep get back it going. They only have one album. That's it. It's like a one-hit wonder. They're a one-album guy. Yeah. See, Joseph Park from Cosmo, just like he just went off the radar. Somebody's like, oh, he's working at Amazon or he's doing something else. It's like, really, you're Joseph Park. You were about to take Cosmo public. You raised $200 million, and you had Cosmo operating in whatever, 15 cities, and it was working in six. So, But it was, you know, imagine what he went through. 
Oh my god! Like, so I want to hear that story. It's like the psychological the psychological broken. damage can make it so that you don't want to do yeah, it again. Yeah, but why does one guy get you know threatened to have his legs broken and, and keeps going and it, and it invigorates him and then another guy it capitulates him? Yeah, if that's know. what happened, I don't I mean, know what no, happened with Joseph. Yeah, I mean it's interesting, right? Yeah, it can break you. I mean it is so intense. It can it break is. you. It, if it, but if it doesn't break you, then it makes you unstoppable, and that's, that's what happened true. to you. Yeah. So now, then when you have the good idea. You're just cracking skulls. You're, you're just like, like I, listen, I've already been on the brink. I've looked at the precipice. Yeah. I've been there. And I get a cease and desist, and I'm like, yeah, whatever. I feel good. You walk along the precipice. That's where yeah. you go for your morning stroll. Yeah. I you're like, like that. oh, I like that. Oh, well, precipice. Look, oh, there's the volcano. <laughs> the precipice. Whatever. All right. No, a lot of people get pushed to the precipice. Sure. And they're like, I don't like this feeling. Right. You get pushed to the precipice. It, it, that, you yeah. feel normal there. Yeah. You feel normal, how, you know, yeah. that things could explode at any point in time, because you know it can. Yeah. And worse that happens is you start again, isn't it yeah. true? Yeah, true. Now, you must have had internal discussions of if we can make it push a button on Uber to this. get a taxi. I love it. Why can't it be push a button to get bagels and locks and a paper? I mean, I, there is a trend in society which I would say is an you know a trend towards an on-demand lifestyle. Yes. There's a lot of things I want on demand. A lot of things. Right. Some of those things you can't. <laughs> can't talk about. Can't talk about. Some of those things are best left to Craigslist. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Fair enough. Some cities it might even be legal what you're talking yes, about. Yes, absolutely. We're a global company. Right. Um, and yeah, it's not some... saying we're going there, but <laughs> In whatever. Amsterdam, push your button, get weed. <laughs> push your button, get a prostitute. <laughs> okay. So um, I you're I think not your push instincts. Your the bottom things. line is that your instincts, your instincts are are pretty solid. Right. Is that when you have the logistics. The logistics fabric yes. underneath it, and you have—I mean, we're a math company. I have a whole division in my company called the math department. Right. Right. Like we have PhDs, we have a computational neuroscientist, a rocket scientist, a uh, a nuclear physicist, like crun crunching numbers so that when you push the button, the car is right freaking next to you because right. we knew you were going to push it, wow. or somebody was. Yeah, precognition. Yeah. So it's just a matter of doing the math, taking the market you have, and then once you have San Francisco. And you have that driver. There's no reason that driver couldn't do an errand for you. Or, you know, maybe not that driver in particular. But maybe but somebody on a, a scooter. You know, again, when we price discriminate, and we have all different types of cars and different ah, kinds of fleets. Yes. Like again, once you have that liquidity. Yes. And once you have that. Once like, you have, and by liquidity, I mean you have the Uber app on my phone, and I, yeah. you know, I, I know how to press it. And we have access to the supply. You know, I saw something in France that was pretty fascinating. Um, when I was coming from the airport, they have a service where a motorcycle will pick yes. you up. Yes. You know about this? Yeah, yeah, of course. This is the most. I'm a, I am such a, such a francophile now. I just like shopping there. That's interesting. I become a total francophile. That's I'm, interesting. I'm down with the socialism. Um, I don't believe you. I, you know what? I, these things of socialism I like. Like I love this mandated sample, the mandated sales twice a year. And oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, and a bread line, not but so it's, much. But it's but you like it from like a it's like a it's like a quirky novelty. Yes, yes. I don't think I, I don't think I could. If pay you were the, the merchant, if you were the merchant, you'd no. be pissed. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. I do not want to pay the one percent wealth tax. And if you actually live there and you only had a sale twice a year, that would suck. Yes. Uh, okay. So. In France, they'll <laughs> pick you up on there. a motorcycle. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. And yeah. they'll drive you from the airport, splitting traffic because it's a pain in the ass to it's get amazing. from Charles de Gaulle. It's amazing. I'm going to do this next time just for the fun of it. If I don't have a roller. Look, we will launch in Paris. Oh. I want motorcycles on there. Yeah. I mean, how beautiful would it be to have a motorcycle fleet? But that's something you could innovate into. I mean, I don't know what the insurance would be, but if you could get somebody now, um, everybody's talking about Airbnb for taxis. Sure. This is a crazy idea to have some random person pick you up, and also, is it, would it be illegal? It'd be, it'd be. I mean, it'd be illegal. Yeah, it'd be <laughs> just straight up illegal. Yeah, it, well, unless, unless the the driver had a license, what's uh, called a TCP license in California. Got it. And he was insured. Right. So if you can solve like getting people these licenses, which is not hard to do, it's actually quite straightforward. But really, it's the insurance problem. And the insurance becomes big. Expensive. The insurance is like you know five six hundred dollars a month. Right. And so, so you better be making car. enough money to make up for that. Right. So Airbnb renting out your couch, not that big of a deal because you don't need to have insurance. But there's still some things in Airbnb that you know it's an illegal like in certain areas is illegal hotel operation, but it still happens. Right. Right. This gets. You don't want to get into that kind of business. We'll see. I mean, the yeah. bottom line is that the bottom line is that we try to go into a city and we try to be totally legitimately legal. Right. 
Um, yeah, there's no reason to just be sit there and be under the uh, waiting for the bomb to drop. No. Right? I, mean, I mean, we have a reputation system, but ultimately, if somebody is a good driver, even yeah. if it's sort of like Airbnb style, they ultimately, you know, if they're making real money, they, you know, they're just going to be good at what they do. They'll end up having a town car. Yeah, or you don't yeah. need this extra capacity issue like you do for couches and guest houses, right? I mean, there's enough cab drivers around to service the populace. We'll see. Oh, you think there needs to be more? Well, look, I mean, we're going to get to a point in San Francisco where there's no more cars. People won't have cars. There's no more. No, what I mean is there's no more town cars. Oh, really? Yeah. Because you're increasing demand that much. Yeah, we're just expansive. Right. And so then... So it, who loses in that? The bus? Bicycles? Uh, look, Who's losing? The cabs? Or is it's it all a, new demand? It's, a, it's, it's expansive. Right. But I remember it's 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 fixed supply. Right. So really, what's happening is people are losing now. Right. And when we roll out, mm. then people lose less. Right. Right. So what do you think would be aside from the motorcycle thing? What do you think would be the perfect natural extension of the service? Like, what's your pers on a personal level? What would be your favorite thing to add to the service? I'm not saying you're going to do it, but what would be the per on your personal level? I mean, like I just want stuff brought to me, right? right. Like whatever I need right now. Hmm. Um, so. You know, I think Cosmos are very interesting. Right. I, uh, you know, or like you could go, so Cosmos like, give me what I need right now. Like, just right. get it for me, get it to me. Right. But there's maybe one that's even more focused, you could say, like delivery of food as an right. example. Right. right. So here, give me my like, farmer's market box. Or, yeah. you know, you like to eat at a restaurant. They don't do delivery. Ah, so now you're doing that like, yeah. We have liquidity in, in cars. Right. So we can make that really interesting. Right. That's I'm like, not saying we do it. I'm right. just saying like that this would be is, your number this one. This is like an interesting. It's just an interesting thing to think about right. while we're going and taking care of the transportation. That would yeah, be one of my favorite extensions, which is they do have this like dine out service here in L.A. Right. where like the restaurants that refuse to deliver, yeah, use that, yeah, and they just put ten bucks on it or ten yeah. percent or fifteen bucks. And I mean, there's ways to do it. We use it all. We there's it all a time. lot of interesting algorithms to make that efficient. And there's something called sure. a traveling salesman problem that we would need to be really rocking. Tell me that. So let's say you had like, the, here, here's the classic computer science problem. 15 cities, you're a traveling salesman. You're starting at this city, you want to end up at this city, and you want to go to those 15 cities in the most, in the shortest, the shortest distance possible. Mm. I think, I don't know where it is exactly, maybe it's 15 or 20, but once you get to like 15 cities, I don't know the exact number, no supercomputer in the world can solve that problem. Wow. It just, the fan out on the complexity of that problem happens so fast you can't solve that problem anymore. Right. It like makes chess look like child's game. Right. Just um, too many paths. It's too many paths. Yeah. And so um, basically the traveling salesman problem is not one of optimizing like or getting the optimal, it's about optimizing. Right. And so being as efficient as you possibly can, this is what is the biggest thing in the jet industry. Right. Right. It's yeah, what do we do with all these empty private jets? Yeah. We need to move them around in the most efficient way possible. Right. And right now, it's like everybody tries to right. make some. I mean, that's always right. a joke about Uber. It's going to be an Uber private right. jet service. But if you did and that, so that would just be a marketing thing, right? Well, no, not necessarily. Look, the jet business, it, just private jet business, is actually mm -hmm. bigger than the commercial jet business. Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. It's something like 30 or $40 billion wow. a year. So the other side of this, like we talked about, OK, let's deliver some food. Maybe. Uber jets. So Uber Jets, I press a button and... And a jet comes and picks you up off of Santa Monica Boulevard. Wow. Like <laughs> Uber uh, Chopper. Uber Chopper. So let's say you're in Midtown in New York yeah. and you're like, Pick me up on the top oh of my God, building. I need to get to JFK ASAP. Right. Town car picks you up, takes you to the nearest helipad and boom, you pop on over to JFK. Uber Chopper will work. That would make sense because yeah. they, do, they do have that service. You could also take you to the Hamptons and stuff yeah. like that. Wow, Travis, we could talk for hours, and we did. Uh, an hour and 20 minutes in. Wow, we did, the, we did an hour and 20. We did an hour and 20, and it's one of the best episodes we've ever done. Thanks for coming in and being so honest. If yeah. you haven't tried Uber, uh, it's coming to your city, and you can use it. Even Chicago, if you're just... Boston, and D.C. in the next few months. Wow. Um, and We're already Seattle, New York, and San Francisco. All you need to do to sign up and, is download the Francisco. iPhone app. Yeah. And then put in your credit card information. That's right. You can do an Android app, or? We have an Android app. Oh, you have an Android app? Yeah, and you yeah. can also use SMS if you want. Oh, you you just SMS. text the number, you just text your location. Oh. Like I go, corner of Santa Monica. I didn't know that. Yeah, Santa Monica and Beverly Glen. And it knows my phone number already, so it knows that's me? Yeah. Oh, and I then, didn't even know and that feature you, existed. It's basically you gotta communicate that it's to people. I know. It's like command line Uber. 
I it's would beautiful. prefer that. It's beautiful. That's beautiful. You can text it. Do oh, it. Eight two seven two two two. That's the short code. I love it. Uh, hey, thank you to. Uh, so anyway, it, when, next time you're on vacation, just download the app and try it. I guarantee you'll have a great, great experience. Or you're already in New York, Seattle, yeah, if you're and already San there, Francisco. Just use it, yeah. Um, it's great. If you're an incredible business development person, manager, or um, salesperson, or uh, developer, and you want to go work at Uber. We are hiring lots of amazing people. Yeah. Please, we're like, we but actually. you only want the best people. We only want the best. The engineers, we got that on lock. We're getting all the engineers. We need more awesome business people. Ah, oh, really? Who That's, says that? Nobody says that. Bring you need it. people to. Launch city, cities, launch, launch city, cities, manage to them, manage those cities, optimize biz dev, marketing, oh, there sales. You go. So if you, I mean, just email Travis. Please, at Travis Uber. at Uber.com. Awesome. Uh, hey, Hiscox, thank you for ensuring all of us and keeping us safe from quarter trillion dollar lawsuits and everything in between. And thank you, GoToMeeting, for making all of our meetings just flawless and stable and HD. Mm, I cannot wait for that HD faces. It is killer. We'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Spend the money and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money. Spend the money and defeat you. It's been a minute, so we thought you were safe. Nah. You trapped behind these bars like you locked in a cage. Yeah. Stuck behind bars, make a minimum wage. Your bars tender. Here's a tip, get you a raise. Ain't nobody gonna offer. Profit to motherfuckers who ain't rocking it, topping the hip hop charts and then stopping it. Quick to drop a set opposite of the hottest shit, copping it. It's the profit kit, always quick to accomplish. I'm positive. Yeah. Getting green like a roster with a lot of dread. Money's piling up like the Washington Monument. The way I'm steering this track, it'll make you cross it. The only time you're gonna see green is when you barf in. I'm the Mothman, consider this the prophecy. I'm in it to win it, that's why I'm making a prophecy. And I won't spend it till my rich is stupendous. When I'm selling sicker than tech, is the method is to keep it in the Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like me. Until we get the money, spend the money and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals. Until we get the money, spend the money and defeat you.